The following newspaper clipping caught our eye. The Law of Chance, which is not susceptible to legislative modification, is the only law that rules the seas. And never in the records of American shipping has there been an instance of such consistent, perversely, and persistent adversity following the fortunes of a sailing vessel as pursued the Harvey Mills. From the hour of launching to the hour of foundering in mid-ocean. Republican Journal of Belfast, Maine, 1887. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, The Unlucky Harvey Mills? Here we are. Enjoy! Some ships gain a reputation for being unlucky over time, as a series of misfortunes seem to haunt them, and people begin to whisper. In the case of the Harvey Mills, as she hit the water in September 1876, people already began to have their doubts. There were several reasons for this. The first was that the 2,077-ton ship was behind schedule before she was launched. The shipyard of Mills in Crichton, in Thomaston, Maine, where she was built, was considered competent. Captain Harvey Mills, for whom the ship was named, was overseeing the construction personally, and the ship herself was considered well-designed. But in the middle of construction, it was found that half of her timbers had been cut wrong and needed to be recut. This was not a small project for the shipyard, since at the time, the Harvey Mills was ranked fourth in size among American ships. Redoing the timbers that had been incorrectly cut meant that a ship that was meant to be launched in mid-August was instead launched in early September, and the ship cost $15,000 more than the initial estimate. The order was given to launch the ship on the first Thursday of September. But again, things went wrong. The blocks were all removed, the ways were greased, and the Harvey Mills refused to move. For the entire day and past midnight, the workers with levers and ropes tried to force the ship to enter the sea. It was not until a little after midnight that the Harvey Mills decided to suddenly rush forward. Her sudden jolt forward was so sudden that one of the workers was crushed lifeless beneath her bow. The Harvey Mills not only hit the water on a Friday, which would have been enough to make people call her a bad luck ship, but she had also started her first voyage having already taken a life. Perhaps it was therefore predictable that her first voyage almost ended in disaster. The Harvey Mills was placed by her owners on the route between Liverpool and Port Royal. On the 7th of October, 1876, the Harvey Mills departed from Maine and headed to Port Royal. This voyage was enough to almost sink her. At some point during the voyage, she sprang a leak that was so bad that her crew considered abandoning her. They were able to reach Port Royal barely and on inspection it was found that she had lost one of her bottom planks. It seemed as though the construction woes that had been suffered by the Harvey Mills still haunted her. They overhauled the freshly built ship, repaired the damage, and loaded her with a cargo of 7,800 bales of cotton that was intended for Liverpool. On leaving Port Royal, the Harvey Mills encountered yet another disaster. She was only five days out of port, having suffered from poor weather all five days, when a sudden cry of fire went up. The cause of the fire was never discovered. The newspapers assumed spontaneous combustion, but by the time that the fire was discovered, the fire was already past investigation. The hold was soon full of choking smoke and the water they tried to pour on the burning cotton to put out the fire was too little too late. They soon battened down the hatches in the hopes of depriving the fire of some oxygen, and changed their course to New York, since 
that was the nearest large port. By the time the ship reached New York, her decks were so hot to balk on that the sailors were forced to drench them with water so they could remain on board, and the mainmast had fallen victim to the fire. They were able to be towed to New York Harbor, where the city's fire crews went to work putting out the blaze, but the damage to both the ship and her cargo was extensive. It would be months of work before the Harvey Mills was ready to take to the sea once again. If there were already murmurs about the Harvey Mills being an unlucky ship before, her first voyage cemented them. The damage to Harvey Mills and her cargo was insured for half a million dollars, and the ship was abandoned to the underwriters who paid for the extensive repairs, and then sold the troubled ship to new owners. It was alleged that the fire had cost two of the sailors on their first voyage their lives, and that the ship was haunted. It did seem that she had more than her fair share of little incidents over the next few years, changed owners often, and struggled to keep sailors for more than one voyage. Then again, with a reputation like that of the Harvey Mills, if she met with bad weather on a voyage, or had a routine incident, people were likely to point immediately to her rocky start. She had gone from being called one of the most promising American ships before her launch, to being called cursed in only a couple of years. On the 21st of May, 1882, about 60 miles from Cape Clear, Ireland, the Harvey Mills would once again be involved in an accident that would make the newspapers. The Harvey Mills and the British bark, the Etta, approached one another at sea, And though no one was entirely certain what the cause for the confusion was, the Harvey Mills changed course several times as the two ships approached one another, meaning that all attempts made by the Etta to avoid the Harvey Mills were rendered meaningless. The Harvey Mills struck the Etta with enough speed that the collision was compared to a battering ram, and the Etta's iron mast crashed down onto the ship, ripping through her. Damaged both by the collision and her mast, the Etta sank like a stone. The crew and the captain of the ship were able to escape and were taken aboard the Harvey Mills, but the Etta sank so quickly that they were not able to save anything from her. They were also not able to relax once they were on board the Harvey Mills. The Harvey Mills had been so badly damaged by the collision that she was also barely keeping afloat. The crew of the Harvey Mills and the crew of the Etta took turns desperately working the pumps until word could be sent for tow boats to bring them safely to Cork. The Harvey Mills was ruled solely responsible for the incident, and with the value of the Etta and her cargo being placed at $155,500, the Harvey Mills was placed up for auction by the courts to try to recoup some of the losses sustained by the owners of the Etta. Once again, the Harvey Mills had new owners this time out of New York. It would be some time before the Harvey Mills would be able to travel to New York, though. Her new owners needed to do extensive repairs to get her seaworthy again after her collision with the Etta. She departed from Queenstown on December 5, 1883, to head to New York, but had to turn back on the 17th of December for further repairs after becoming partially demasted. Not only that, but in the storm where she was partially demasted, two of her sailors were also washed overboard and lost. In April 1883, while still in Liverpool after being rebuilt once again, the Harvey Mills was once more placed on the auction block. Her new owner was of her home port of Thomaston, Maine, but it was his intention to station her out of Port Royal. It was hoped that a change would be good for the troubled ship. The Harvey Mills suffered from such poor weather on her way to Port Royal that she was a whole month behind schedule when she arrived, and had been given up for lost. Her crew had nearly starved, and had run out of fresh water. Their appearance when they arrived in Port Royal elicited a lot of sympathy. Once she had landed her cargo, the Harvey Mills was sent to San Francisco. Her owner had decided that his new ship might be better served in the capacity of a coastal trader traveling from San Francisco to Seattle. 
It was bemoaned that though the Harvey Mills seemed like a good sailor still, events always seemed to conspire against her, showing how fast she actually could be. Remarkably, the Harvey Mills had an uneventful voyage to San Francisco, where in 1885 she was placed under the command of Captain Crawford, a captain with a very good reputation for his command of coastal craft. Her new route kept her mainly in the shelter of the land, or islands, which lessened her chances of being caught in another storm. It seemed as though the Harvey Mills might finally be safe. She also had a very experienced first mate named Cushman, and a crew of 24, none of whom were in a position to know of the terrible reputation the Harvey Mills had gained over her career on the Atlantic. The Harvey Mills even enjoyed some uneventful voyages up and down the coast from San Francisco to Seattle. On the 12th of December, 1886, the Harvey Mills departed from Seattle with a cargo of coal for San Francisco. For the first time since going on that route, the Harvey Mills struck a terrible storm, one of the worst seen on the coast for some time. First Mate Cushman would later admit that the cargo of coal on board made the ship heavily burdened. He protested that they had not overloaded the ship, but that she was carrying all that it was possible for her to comfortably carry. When the storm struck them on the 14th, there was some concern on the ship that if the cargo shifted, they would be doomed. But he said that at no point that seemed to happen, since when there was a lull in the storm, the ship would right herself on an even keel. The heavy weight did impact how well the ship could handle the storm, though. The first victim of the storm was the ship's top gallant sail, which split in half with a deafening sound and they were not able to replace it in the storm. As the ship wallowed in the waves, and the storm increased in fury, the ship's port side was often underwater, up to the deck. Still, Cushman had confidence enough in the ship that he took a chance to go to his room for a minute. He found it full of water. Assuming that it was just a porthole that he had accidentally not sealed well before the storm, he bailed out his room, and started to wipe it down only to find that the porthole was just fine, but his room had begun to fill with water again. Reporting this to the captain, it was found that there were 22 inches of water in the hold. The crew manned the pumps. Working the pumps proved almost impossible. The seas were now washing the decks, and soon the port quarterboat had been washed away out of its skids. The Harvey Mills had developed a strong list to port, and as waves washed over the ship, the men who were trying to man the pumps were repeatedly thrown from their posts by the movement of the water. The ship's cabin had been smashed to pieces already. Cushman described the ship wallowing like a log at this point, and the pumps were no longer any use against the oncoming water. When they tried to change the course to mitigate the damage to the ship that way, they found that the ship no longer answered the helm, and with most of their sails having been carried away, there was little more they could do except hope for the best. The men on the Harvey Mills passed a miserable night, and as dawn broke around 4 a.m. on the morning of the 15th of December, they found that the ship was now on her beam ends, still with a heavy port list. Captain Crawford, hoping to right the ship somewhat, ordered that both the mizzen and mainmasts be cut away. Even this did not go smoothly. As the mizzen mast was cut away, it hit the afterhouse, and as the mainmast was cut away, it smashed the ship's longboat, and then pounded on the ship's hull, allowing even more water to rush into the sinking ship. The men on board the ship decided that the only thing they could do was abandon the Harvey Mills. The only boat remaining was the ship's lifeboat, and this would not hold everyone on board. On learning that Captain Crawford did not know how to swim, First Mate Cushman came to the conclusion that it would make the most sense if Captain Crawford took his place in the lifeboat, and Cushman, who did know how to swim, took his chances remaining on the Harvey Mills. Captain Crawford disagreed, feeling it was his duty to remain with his ship, and while the two men were still debating the matter, 
a large wave washed the lifeboat into the sea. Not willing to lose the one remaining boat on the ship, Captain Crawford and five other men jumped into the sea after it. All six managed to reach it and turn it right side up, but soon a wave smashed down onto them and flipping the boat over again. The last Cushman saw of the boat was it upturned, being carried off by the strong waves with some of the men, Captain Crawford included, still clinging to it. By five in the morning, there were only 11 people left on board the Harvey Mills, including first mate Cushman. The rest had been washed away. The men who were still on board were all clinging to the starboard side of the afterhouse. As Cushman began to feel the ship give her final shudders, and it became clear that the ship was going to go down, he became concerned he was going to get swept along with the suction as the ship sank. Rushing to the starboard rail, Cushman jumped overboard and swam a distance away. It was only when he was confident that he had gone far enough that Cushman turn and he watched as the Harvey Mills sank stern first. Once the Harvey Mills was completely gone from sight, Cushman swam back to the site of the wreck to find that three other men were still afloat on top of a piece of the afterhouse decking, which functioned as a makeshift raft. The damage done by the falling mizzenmast had done them a service and broken it free. Cushman joined them, and through the night, they drifted. The next morning, they came upon another piece of the afterdeck of the ship, with another five men on it. On seeing them, the men on the other piece of decking managed to maneuver alongside them, but Cushman became alarmed by the behavior of the men who were singing and dancing, even though, over the course of the day, they had gone from five men to four. The men on the other raft proposed to lash the two rafts together, but the men on Cushman's raft refused the offer, and soon the two pieces of decking were washed apart, with no one seeing the piece with the four men on it again. There was no food or drink on Cushman's raft, and the sea was still so rough that even if there had been, it would have been soon washed overboard. On the 17th, the group was already becoming more weak, but they enjoyed a rainstorm which allowed them some fresh water. On the 17th, they also spotted a bark, but even though she was only two miles away, and they tied three pairs of pants to a stick to try to signal her, the bark departed, having apparently never seen them. The next day, a Saturday, they saw a barkentine, and she clearly saw their signal because she headed towards them, but as night fell, a fog came up, and they were separated. This was apparently too much for one of the sailors who had been muttering in a corner of the raft for a time. Announcing to the officers that he was going to buy some straw, the man calmly stepped off the side of the raft and was lost before they could save him. As Sunday dawned, Cushman and the remaining two men no longer had any strength to try to signal ships they saw, though they left their flag of pants flying. The sailors were wearing oilskins, but Cushman was only dressed in a shirt, pants, and a pair of socks without any shoes, and he was starting to show signs of exposure. It was, therefore, with great relief that at nine in the morning, they saw a bark bearing down on them, and they realized that their flag had been seen. At ten in the morning, they were on board the Majestic out of San Francisco, under the command of Captain Bergman. Captain Bergman and his wife took it upon themselves to nurse the three sailors back to health, and by the time they were landed on San Pedro, they were in a good condition again. From there, they made their way to San Francisco, where they reported what had happened. In San Francisco, it had been realized that the Harvey Mills was overdue, and some concern had begun to be felt, but when they heard what had happened, there was still shock. The Harvey Mills had undergone extensive rebuilding, after all, and had a good crew. Everyone had expected that she would be able to weather the storm. Once the news reached the East Coast, however, there was far less shock. And the papers of Maine simply reported that it was the end that one could expect of a ship launched on a Friday and baptized in blood. 
For more information, please see the Republican Journal of Belfast, Maine from February 3rd, 1887, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.